Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Father's house. Those who are in-house today, if you please stand in the presence of the Lord. I'd like to read from the Passion Translation, Psalm 118. It says, I have found the gateway to God, the pathway to his presence for all his lovers. I will offer all my loving praise to you, and I thank you so much for answering my prayer and bringing this, me salvation. The very stone the Masons rejected as flawed has turned out to be the most important capstone of the arc, arch, holding up the very house of God. The Lord himself is the one who has done this. And it's so amazing, so marvelous to see. This is the very day of the Lord that brings gladness and joy, filling our hearts with glee. Our God, please come and save us again. Bring us into your breakthrough victory. Blessed is the one who comes to us, that sent the sent one of the Lord. And from within the temple we cry, we bless you. In King James it says, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will, we will rejoice and be glad. It is a choice. It's a determination of our heart. No matter what is going on in your life today, God wants us to praise him. He wants us to rejoice in him because he's able to bring us through. How many believe that this morning, that God's able to bring you through? Amen. Worship team, welcome on Sunday Good morning. morning. Good, Good morning. morning. <laughs> okay, we're going to raise a hallelujah this morning. Amen. Hallelujah.
this verse on Wednesday night and God provided a song I've never heard before and I, I hope it touches you uh, it's based totally on scripture and very appropriate for what this nation is going through right now
need a healing church. Our nation needs a healing. We need a healing. God never surprises me. Hallelujah.
probably said this a million times the centerpiece was the Lord going to the cross for you for me to forgive our sins and I'd like to send an invitation over the airwaves if you don't know Jesus Christ today I beg you it'd be the best decision you can make make him your Lord and Savior of your life.
Father, that's our prayer this morning. That you would lead us to the cross. Father, we're so thankful for what took place at Calvary for each one of us. For through Calvary, we're saved. We're born again. We're delivered. We're set free. We're sanctified. We're cleansed. Where the power of the enemy is broken through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring us back to the cross, Lord, and the preaching of the cross. That we would truly exalt the name of Jesus in our midst. Father, as we even sang that song this morning concerning healing our land, we pray that you would heal our land. And Father, you would bring black and white and yellow and and all races together. You would begin to bring, Lord, even the church together by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we just pray for those in Washington, D.C. that represent us. We pray, oh God, that you would give them wisdom and understanding and grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be upon them. We pray for revival in Washington, D.C. We pray for a move of your spirit that would just come and do such a a tremendous work. Father, we're, we're desperate for more of you. We're desperate. We as a church, we as a people, we as a a city, we as an area, Father, we as a region, we're we're desperate for more of God. Father, you would just come, there would be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. Oh God, we call out to you this morning and say, oh God, heal our land, heal your people. Put a heart cry within us to call out to you, Lord, that, Father, that we would not stop. We would continue to press in. We'd be tenacious. Tenacious in coming into your your presence. And, Father, we would not give up. We would not give up until we see the answer. Father, whether it's salvation of our relatives, our family members. Father, whether it's, Lord, friends that we have that need to know Jesus. Father, situations of healing within our lives emotionally and physically. Father, that we would not give up today, but we would press in. And we would call upon your name. And we would stand and declare and decree that you're more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, all that we ask for. Oh God, we're so confident this day, Lord, that you're going to do a work. You're going to do a work. A work that only you can do. And Father, I thank you for establishment of that work within our lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Bless those watching this morning. Bring salvation to our households. And Father, that we will truly see what you're doing in this hour. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for worship team this morning. Debbie, if you come and just share with us some of Good morning. So good to look out and see all you people out here. It's wonderful to have you back. Um, we Communion is uh, available throughout the service. It is on the uh, communion table. Please help yourself anytime you feel you would like to. Um, For your safety precautions, the side door of the church is going to be closed on Sundays around 10.15. There's no anniversaries this week, and there are no birthdays this week. How about that? 
If you do have an anniversary or birthday that we don't have documented, please come and see Terry Rose, and we will be very happy to put your name uh, and your dates on the calendar. Um, midweek service on Wednesday is also going to it's going to be live streamed. It's not here at the church. It will be live streamed. Sunday services will be here and live streamed. We have the food bank on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. till 12. So if you know anyone who is in need of food, please have them come and see us. Uh, prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests, you can uh, notify Beverly Peterzak at 570-344-2624. And I know Beverly will get that right on the prayer chain. And uh, you will be prayed for. <laughs> and that situation will turn. Um, prayer targets. We're going to pray for the healing of Bob Kamasi, of Denny, of Doug, of Jean, of Dave, of Tom. We're going to pray for Laura for a family situation. We're going to pray for a young couple who's going through a really rough time. Uh, we're praying for our country. We're praying for those who are suffering from the coronavirus. We're praying for those who are victims of sex trafficking, children and young women. Um, very important. It's going on all around us. And we're going to pray for um, Washington, D.C. We need to pray for all those involved there, President, Congress, House of Representatives, Senate. They all need our prayers. Thank you. Amen. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't have um, a verse for you this morning, but I do have a quote that uh, pretty much embodies the entire New Testament. And it was said by Martin Luther King Jr., who we celebrate as a nation tomorrow for all the things that he's done and, and the fight that he fought and the equality that he was looking for. And I think it's a very poignant quote. I think it's something that if we think about this, um, it's something we can, we can act out. It's not one of those high and lofty ideas that you can just plant in the back of your mind and think about it when somebody says, do you know any nice things to say? You know, this is something that if we walk out of here thinking about this today, it, it could change the way that you deal with people and, and how you live your life. And the quote is, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Which I think is an incredible statement. You know, like we sometimes we have this misconstrued idea of what greatness is and and um, what our goals in life might be. But you know, Jesus told us that we were we were called to serve, that we were to love one another, that we were to engage with one another, that we were to to give to one another. And uh, this quote is a lot like that. And if you read a lot of Martin Luther King stuff, you, you'll understand that he's a, he was a faith-based man that also believed that God told us to love one another. No, and that no. Love replaces I'm hate and is that. greater than that. So um, just leave you with that thought this morning that you can be great by serving, by serving one another and loving one another. Um, it's offering. I don't know. Is there two today? It's just one. All right, there's just one today. Um, I don't remember what, what the system is come up and back around. Um, they're up here on the sides. There's a give it to God box. Um, yeah, there's there's that one. <laughs> and the two money plates are up here. Um, if you don't have anything to give, I'm going to ask a, a special request this morning. If you don't have anything to give, will you just pray over the money? Pray over the situation, whatever it is, submit it to God. I, it may sound trivial, but it's an act. Just step out for a minute with me and as an act of faith to just come up and, and place your hand over the plate and say a quick prayer to, to bless the offering. We really want to be a blessing to our community, to the people around us, to do the things that God wants us to do. And if we don't have, sometimes we feel like it's not enough because we don't have. You do have because there's a faith in you. 
And the faith is what we need to work out the things that God wants us to do because that's what he uses to motivate us. So if you don't have this morning, there is no judgment, there is no condescension, there's none of that stuff. I'm Nobody's saying anything to you. But if you would, just come up and, and say a quick prayer. Or even if you're dropping money, say a quick prayer. You know, bless this this morning with us so that we can further grow to reach the people that need to be reached. Thank you. Father, I pray over this this morning. I pray that you would put your hand on the people who are giving this morning, God, and, and bless them with a blessing of prosperity, with a blessing of peace, with a blessing of health, and with wisdom, God, that we would wake up each morning longing for doing what it is that you want us to do, reaching the people that we can reach. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When all you have is Jesus' love Storms of life are raging. When the storms of life are raging. When the storms of life are raging. Jesus is. Sing to him. When all you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. When all you need is Jesus. Oh, worship him. When all you need is Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Rich, Jesus is enough. Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team. We appreciate you. Love you guys. Love you too. Love you Thank too. you. Love you guys too. <laughs> These are just, just a couple of quick stories from, from Billy Graham that I, I picked up. He says, some years ago, I was on a plane sitting across from the mayor of Charlotte, John Belk. There was a man sitting near us who was ob- obli- oblis- was, was drunk, okay? <laughs> Intoxicated. He was act- acting boisterous and rude, bothering people around him harassing the flight attendants, and even trying to pinch some women who made their way down the aisle. Trying to distract him and perhaps calm him down, John Belk tapped him on his shoulder, pointed in my direction, and said, Do you know who's sitting right there? Who, the man answered. John Belk said, That's Billy Graham. The man jumped up from his seat, came over to me with his hand extended, and said enthusiastically, Put her there, Reverend. Your preaching has done so much good for my life. (laughs) Another little story. I heard about a man who was supposed to preach for 20 minutes, and he spoke for 30 and 40 and 50. An hour and 20 minutes later, he was still speaking. The man who introduced him couldn't stand it any longer. He picked up a gavel and threw it at the speaker. It missed the speaker and hit the man in the front row. As the man in the front row was going into subconsciousness, he said, hit me again, I can still hear him. (laughs) I want to start out this morning, if you'll permit me. I guess it's not up to you. (laughs) 
That is up to you whether you listen or not. But I, I want to do a quick review of Wednesday night. You know, if you haven't heard Wednesday night, go to my webpage or down to my Facebook site and, and you can and listen to it there. But I took this scripture from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and I'd like to read them. I actually am just reading 1, th- 1 and 2 to the day, but for time's sake. It says, as for us, as for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin which so easily fell in, we fell into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race. And life is a journey. It is as a marathon. And, you know, they say at the 21st mile. Now, you would think it would be. The marathon is like 26 miles, 385 yards. So, therefore, you would think when you hit what they call hit the wall, you would think it would be about 13 miles, about halfway through. But it's not that. Most marathon runners hit the wall at the 21st mile. And that's when, in their mind, saying, I can't go. They've already gone three quarters of the race, and yet, and they have about a quarter to go, and they're physically able to do it, but mentally, something gets within them saying, I'm going to give up. Well, we as Christians are in the same area. We're running a marathon, and in this marathon, sometimes we hit the wall. And we have a choice whether we're going to go on with Jesus or whether we're going to give up. And the next verse is a very interesting. It says, life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out before us. We look. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten. King James says, fix your eyes upon Jesus. The Lord spoke to me last weekend that we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. With everything else going on all around us, it can be a distraction. So we need to return in fixing our eyes upon Jesus. And it says, fasten our gaze unto Jesus who birthed faith within us, who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. Aren't you thankful that you're his today? And that joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross, was because of you, Marianne. He had a joy within his heart because he knew it was about us. He knew what he was doing was about Donna Rubino and Debbie Walls and, and Lanny and, and the, the, each one of us in here this morning. So he, it says, because of the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered his humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm not going to read the story I read on Wednesday, but I'm just going to quickly tell you what happened. Jeremiah Johnson, who is a recognized man in the body of Christ, God has used him prophetically, and, and um, he has shared the gospel worldwide. And he um, apologized to the body of Christ recently because he felt he was wrong on what he shared about the election that just took place. He had death threats. He had, oh, I think it was 500 people who cussed him out. Now, now let me tell you, these, this isn't the world. These are Christians. This is the Christian body of Christ. They came against his family. They ridiculed him because he apologized. Because he apologized because he missed the mark. We, t- we sang this morning about healing our land. And I truly, with all of my heart, need, we need to pray, Second Chronicles 7, 14, we need to pray that God would continue to bring a healing to our nation. But you know that there's something greater than even our nation that needs healing today. And that is the church of the living God. The body of Christ needs restoration and they need healing. Now, you may not understand this, but 
but, and I might get into this for a few minutes, but, but God doesn't want us to take, take us back. God wants to further us in his kingdom, and he wants to make it better than ever before. I see in the word of God where it says he's coming back. How many believe he's coming back today? He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And therefore, the way I see that is, there is going to be somehow, not in my comprehension or my natural mind, but by my spirit mind, I can see that he's going to bring unity to the body of Christ. He's going to bring us together as believers because one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand. And I share these things about restoration. There must be a changing of mindsets. Your mind must be changed. That if we have our opinions that are ruling and reigning within our lives that are causing us to be distracted from Jesus Christ and one another, we need to lay down our opinions. And we need to press in to God. I also share that there needs to be a willingness to listen. To listen, and James was sharing this about servant who I'm going to get. It's interesting, he said what he said because I'm going to get into this this morning. But you and I must be willing to listen to other people, even, even if they're saying something different than what we're saying. There needs to be a willingness to listen. Listen, I mentioned also that in order for all this to come about, the unity in the body, body of Christ, there must be a move of God. There has to be. You know what the charismatic move did back in the 70s and 80s? It brought me in. It brought Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, Catholics. It brought all denominations from all over the world. It brought them together in, into the spirit of the Lord and, and into the power of the word of God and into Jesus Christ. So, Folks, I'm telling you what we need today is we need a move of God. We need revival. The only thing that's going to bring unity in the body of Christ is a move of God. How, how many believe that today? It has to be a move of God. And I said number four, there, there must be a heart change to bring us into his presence. And then I went into some areas, and I'll, I'll try to do this quickly because I, I want to get into some other area, but... I shared, let me see, five areas quickly of what I shared Wednesday. You can get the whole scope if you listen. But number one, I said, especially with what is going on right now, we need to correct conspiracy theories. There are a lot. I, I, I was bombarded, I said, last weekend. All through the weekend, in the Monday and Tuesday, I was talking to people texting people and in discussion because there are so many conspiracy theories that are out there that are being proposed to the body of Christ and many Christians are listening to these conspiracy theories. How many have ever heard of Lance Wallenauer? I've listened to Lance Wallenauer and I believe he's given some biblical insight and some interpretation and understanding to some of this. But just coming, in, at least in my heart, there's more clarity that is, is taking place. And, and we, we need, if these things are not true, we need to debunk them. Number two, we need to get back to centering on the cross of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the cross. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yeah. Folks, through the cross of Jesus Christ, that's the power of God. It's foolishness to the world. That's why they don't understand what you're talking about. Beverly, sometimes when you're witnessing, they have no idea what you're talking about because it's foolishness. Yeah. They're ignorant, and I don't say that in a nasty way, way but the Bible uses that word. They're ignorant to the cross of Jesus Christ. They don't have an awareness or an understanding of what we believe today. That's our basis of our faith, is the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And I said, we, we need, folks, to come back to a spirit of repentance. There must be a spirit of repentance that comes to the church. 
And I shared the scripture from Acts chapter 3, 19. Repent then, turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Matthew chapter 3, 8 says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I like the, the Passion Translation. It says this, You need to prove your repentance by a changed life. How do people know that you've repented? Because it will make a difference within your life. It's a 180 degree turn from where you were headed to where now you're going. So many people say, I repent, but there's not a change in their lifestyle. They can continue in their same sin, their same areas of their life. So there, there needs to be a spirit of repentance. How many believe that that has to come to the body of Christ? If if my people, who are called by my name, shall what? Humble themselves and turn from their wicked way. He'll hear. He'll hear from heaven and he'll heal the land. We sang the song, heal the land. How's it going to happen? When the body of Christ begins to turn unto him and turn from the way. I said, James mentioned this somewhat this morning too. We need to have love and compassion on fellow believers. How will the world know about Jesus if we have division in the body of Christ? How will the world see an example, see a demonstration of the power of God in your life and in my life? How will they want what we have unless we show it to them? How many know that's not always with verbiage, with words? How many understand that your witness is not a lot with words? Your witness is this, your attitude, your actions, how you react to a given situation at work, in the home, and so forth. How, what, what is your action and reaction when trouble strikes when trouble and difficulty happens within your life, how do you react? The world is watching you. The world is watching. A demonstration. Because if, if you react with anger and malice and unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment, they'll think, they don't have anything different than I have. But if you react and say, Lord, I forgive, I release they're going to see a change. Hallelujah. I talked about John chapter 17. And, and the number five was we need a spirit of unity in John chapter 17. And in John chapter 17 that we may be one even as the Father and Son and Holy Spirit are one. Can you say amen to that? That was Wednesday night's message in a nutshell. I felt two things that the Lord spoke to me, and these don't really have to do with my message, but I need to share them with you because I feel that something's happening in the body of Christ today. I believe that, and the Lord gave me the word, apostolic shift. An apostolic shift. Now, you may say, well, what in the world is that? Well, we know about pastors. I'm one of them. We know about evangelists. We've heard evangelists come in the church. We know about teachers who teach the Word of God. And a pastor can be a teacher. And we know about um, prophets. We've heard a lot about prophets in recent days. But many times we don't understand apostles. Apostles are... One, in the definition, is one who is sent, one who is commissioned by the church. Um, he is actually, he, he's a church builder, or he's a church restorer. He is sent by a group, by a church, out to see another church built up, restored, brought in to the presence of God, to a move of God. And I believe this is shift that is happening apostolically in the body of Christ to bring us into a place of love and healing. God wants to bring apostles into, uh, with us and with churches to bring a message in saying that Jesus Christ wants to heal you. 
Jesus Christ wants to set you free and deliver. And I believe with this, as a, as a, I'm, I'm sorry this morning, for some reason some words don't want to come out. Apostolic, in this apostolic shift, God wants to usher in the miraculous. And so there's a demonstration that is coming. And with that, he showed me, he gave me the word increase. That you needed to prepare and be expecting increase in your life. Increase, and number one that he showed me was an increase of God's favor upon you. That God's favor would come upon you. His power, his insight, his wisdom, discernment. How many need discernment today? That we would discern we would be able to understand what's going on. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others would realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. I want to take a few moments this morning and ask you a question. Because I'm asking myself this question, I have been asking myself since I started really preparing for this. Are we really reaching people? Are we really reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're called to reach all people, all races, and people of different backgrounds, different belief systems. And God wants you and I to develop, and I've used this term before, but sometimes I don't think we may understand it. God is developing within you and myself. He wants to develop a sphere of influence. He has given each one of you this morning a sphere, a territory, an area, a people to reach that maybe nobody else can reach them except you. And those people are in your sphere of, of influence. It's, it could be geographical. It could be cultural. It could be through relationships that you have built that that becomes your sphere of influence. But we all, all need to understand that, that God has given every person in this assembly, those persons that are watching today, the people out in other churches, he's given you a sphere. He's given you a territory of influence. You can, Sandra can influence and Rudy can influence people in their sphere that I can. Now, sometimes your spear may overlap with my spear, but sometimes our spears don't overlap. Your spear, or your spear is an individual spear that God's given you. And thank God he's given you influence in the world today. Aren't you thankful for that? That God's given you power and authority to influence the world. I want you to know, I might let you in on a secret. Satan is not in control. God's still on the throne this morning. Now, I want to give you a couple of talking points and we're going to branch off, but people listen. People listen through built relationships. When I begin to treat them like friends, can I say that again? People begin to listen when we build relationships, when I begin to treat them like friends. When we serve and have a servant's heart, it's not serving because we have to. It's serving because we want to. Our hearts have been touched. As we serve... The definite, definition, definition of a Christian is demonstrated. As you and I serve, people get a definition of what a Christian really is. Are you out there? People get a definition of what a Christian is when we serve. And doing the message 
precedes telling the message many times. And the last talking point is, we need to focus on planting rather than the harvest because God is the one who brings the harvest and the increase. We get distracted sometimes by results. When we run up against a roadblock or a person who will not listen to us, we get distracted and turned off. It's very interesting. Let me just share a couple of scriptures with you. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19 says this, Yet when the Son of Man came and went to feasts and drank wine, you said, Look at this man. He is nothing but a glutton and a drunkard. He spends all his time with tax collectors and other affluent sinners. But God's wisdom will be visible, visibly seen, living in those who embrace it. Luke 7, 34, The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bipper. A friend, a friend, everyone say friend. friend. He was a friend of publicans or tax collectors and sinners. His mission needs to be our mission. And his mission was that he went amongst the sinners. He, how many realize that he didn't deal with the religious people the same way he did with the sinners? How many of us this morning have friends that are sinners? And sometimes I think what happens is we get religious. And we feel that we're going to be contaminated. I was taught that. I was taught that as a young Christian. I was taught this. I was taught, you can talk to sinners, but don't associate. Because you might be contaminated. What is in their lives will come into your life. Now, I understand that. I understand in rubbing shoulders that that there can be a transfer. But folks, if we're walking in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ and the Word of God, we need to become friends of sinners. Oh, pastor, what kind of doctrine is that? That's Jesus' doctrine. He became a friend of the publicans and the sinners. And my question is, are you and I, are we influencing them or are they influencing us? What type of influence do you have upon the people around you? You know, Jesus, we saw by the scripture, he's criticized, he was condemned for what he did. He was criticized for, for dining with sinners. But how do they know unless we show them? How do they come to Jesus unless we welcome people that even the religious community would cast away? You know, we've been sent into the world with, with that same spirit and that same mission and the same purpose and to love them into the kingdom. And I want to just talk about this for a few minutes this morning because I think we must deal with religious mindsets if we're going to be effective and we're going to have influence today because it's your, and I'm speaking for myself too, it's your and I mindsets, religious, religious mindsets that get us into trouble. And you say, I don't have any religious mindsets. Well, let's identify some and see if you have any of the religious mindsets. See, a religion, the spirit of religion, I believe is a force that tries to get in to act, us to act pious, self-righteous, or super spiritual. There are people in the body of Christ that just act super spiritual. They know all the answers. And that, I believe, this is my own belief, you can take it for what it's worth, but I, I believe the spirit of religion is an enemy that's always been around. But I believe 
that is increasing, especially in this whole situation I mentioned before with the different conspiracy theories and, and all this have the spirit of religion, a religious spirit is an attempting to attack the church and be divisive in the body of Christ today. And it's one of the biggest influences in the churches that is causing division. See, religion, or this religious spirit, you can put it in both terminology, but religion or a religious spirit, it's a performer. It's a performer. It performs to get attention. It puts itself out in front for the applause of man rather than for the applause of God. It goes on Facebook all the time and says, oh, woe is me, because it's looking for attention. It comes to church and it looks for attention. It's a performer. It attempts to show off. To show how spiritual I am. I'm a great man of God. Power of God's within me. I believe all that, that power of God's within me, but I don't have to, I have, don't have to declare that because I need to come to the place of humility and say, God, you're the one that's working in and through me. A religious spirit is legalistic. It concentrates on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. It will cut people off. It will cut people off from coming in to this congregation. That legalistic spirit will cut people off from walking in the door because they don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't do things like you. And that religious mindset, that religious spirit begins to take over where we become critical and judgmental of somebody else. And it hinders our witness because we fail to talk and share in our sphere of influence with other people because we have this religious spirit. See, Religion cries for justice. See, we, how, many, how many could say the rest of the service, and I could probably go around, I could, you could say how many, some fault did I have? I could start with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can go to Donna, and Donna could give me a fault she has seen in my life over the years. And Rich could go and say a fault that he has seen in my life over the years. Because... Well, see, religion cries out for justice. And I'm not saying God is not a just God. He is, but this religious spirit, they're wrong, and we may need to make sure that they know it. They are wrong, and we need to make sure. But see, relationship, folks here, relationship calls out for mercy to build the relationship. God forgave you and I of much. How many believe that this morning through the cross of Calvary? I can tell you, you are forgiven of much. How we also should forgive others of their muches. Religion is very harsh and it's very dogmatic. It won't budge. I got into some things and I was nice. Folks, just so you know, I was nice. In this whole area of conspiracy theories, I just shared what I felt was the truth. And I found that people were, began to attack because they won't budge. They won't budge. That's what's the problem of the, bringing healing to the body of Christ because we become so dogmatic, so doctrine ornate, or, doctrine. Oriented, thank you, Rich. 
You preach the message for me today. I'll get through these words this way. Orient it. Doctrine oriented. How many know your doctrine may be wrong? Mine was before. Baptism, Holy Spirit. Uh, that's ripped out of the pages. Okay. This religious spirit will infiltrate your life. This religious spirit will blind, and we sang, I think we sang about freedom this morning, didn't we? It will blind your freedom. It will steal your liberty in the Holy Spirit. It will stop your advancement in the kingdom. It will stop your progress of preaching the gospel. It will corrupt your perception. I've seen this happen so many times. This religious spirit will come in and it, it, will, it will corrupt your perception of who you are in Christ Jesus. How many found that to be true? The body of Christ, that a lot of people have a hard time dealing with who they are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, I, I am I'm more than a conqueror. I'm in Him, I'm loved, I'm accepted. In Him, I'm victorious. In Him, I'm an overcomer. In Him, I, I'm going forward in my progress in the kingdom of God. But see, that religious spirit, because we were taught religion. I was in a church that taught religion. My upbringing was in religion. It was do's and don'ts. It was the law, the letter of the law rather than the law of love. And some people, even sitting here today, you've not come in. And I'm saying, it's still a journey even for me at times because the lies of the enemy still try to come in and tell me who I am. And the lies of the enemy telling me who I am are completely opposite of what God says I am in Him. And your perception of who you are in Jesus, you're blinded. And then, then see, this, this is the difficulty. People have accepted what the enemy or other people have said about them rather than what God has said about them. And that religious spirit, that spirit of religion has overtaken them and controlled their life to where they're not free. They're bound. And you can be a Christian for years and still be bound. Still be bound. Still be bound. I might close here in a second. Our aim in this world is not to be liked. but to be lo to love. I, I know I've shared this before. Sometimes Debbie says, I don't like you right now. Yep. Come on. But you have to love me. You're not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> How many realize Jesus wasn't a fan favorite? Jesus' mission was he came to serve And I'm, I want to read one verse and then I'm, I'm going to close. But in Mark chapter 12, verse 12 says, Now the chief priests, religious scholars, and leaders realized that Jesus' parable was aimed at them. They had hoped to arrest him then and there, but they feared the reaction of the crowd, so they left him alone and went away. You know, I was walking around before church today and I went back and I don't know if you even see this when you go out of the church. But right above the back doors, it says these words, Go ye into all the world. And, and my question to me, to, to myself and to you is, are, are we really influencing? Are you and I influencing the world today? Are we influencing the people around us in a positive way that they would see a difference in your life? and in my life. And they would want it to change. I, I know I've told it 
different times, but the thing that brought me into the charismatic move and into a Pentecostal experience was I'd been in church. I went every Sunday in Presbyterian church and Methodist churches, other churches, but when I went into this spirit-filled church for the very first time, I thought they were weird and crazy, and I thought, I have to get out of here. But I stayed. And what I realized was in that service was that they had something that I didn't have. They had a joy. They had life. They were clapping their hands. They were lifting their hands. They were dancing. They were excited. And one of the very first ser services I in, went into, they cast out a devil. And I walked out of there and said, I'm not going to go back there. But, <laughs> but then I came to my senses and realized that they had something that I didn't have, and I wanted it. I wanted it. I wanted it, and, and I got it. Do you want it today? Do you want what he has for you? And are you willing, if you get it, to take it? Because... My, my question, and for the last week or so, the Lord has just been speaking, are we really influencing the people around us? And I'm not even calling you to go out on the street and not, or knock on doors and evangelize. I'm t t asking you, would you be a friend? Would you be a friend to the sinner? You would be, build a relationship with a person that doesn't know Jesus. And we do that in, in our workplace. But are we willing to allow them to watch us and see what we're made of? To see what's really within our heart. And Adam, here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 8. That he tests us, tries us, and proves us to see what's really in your heart and my heart whether we'll serve him or not. What's within today? What are other people saying? What influence do you have? How are you talking? What's your attitude? What's your actions? What's your reaction? The world is watching. And when we see that sign, go into all the world, we leave this place, they're watching you. They're watching. The grocery store, they're watching you. The neighbor's watching you. And we need to pray for the gentleman, um, Doug, who lives over here, who owns half the drive into our park parking lot. He is in um, the hospital in ICU. I believe right now he's unresponsive. Um, and he has covid and we need to really pray for him as well. He's a neighbor. I know that the neighbor right across the street, there's a lot happening in our neighbor. There are gentlemen right across the street. Um, help me, Adam. Denny. Denny. Dennis, Denny. Lost his wife several months ago. And we were able to send them a donation. And I've talked to him a couple of times. And he's our neighbor. He's our neighbor. We need to be an influence upon them. And I'll close in this. I shared here a couple weeks ago that the Lord spoke to me that 2021 20, was going to be a year of giving. And I wasn't just talking about us giving, which I believe God wants to bring a spirit of giving. A spirit of giving goes beyond what you're required to give. You understand that? Spirit of giving goes beyond the required 10%. Because you're held by the law. I'm just going, let me see. $500, $50, no more, no less. It can be religious. But I said, my heart was really impacted by the Lord in saying, I want you as a church. God has blessed us through coronavirus. I want you, I just praise him. God has blessed us financially. And I, I just give God the glory. That doesn't mean you stop giving. 
That means give more to the kingdom, not to me. But the Lord said to my heart, he says, I want you to begin monthly. Here we go. I want you to give $1,000 to some organization, some place in need. Pastor, you can't do that. We'll be broke. (laughs) Well, we gave the first 1,000 out the other day, and I just rejoiced. We gave it down to this um, Keystone Mission, Scranton Rescue Mission. They're dealing with homeless, and people are out on the streets. We gave a a $1,000 check to them the other day. That should cause you to rejoice. I don't know. Now, if you have a religious spirit, you may be very upset about that. You may be upset if you have a religious spirit because you may start, $1,000. Well, God said that's the beginning point. That's just the beginning. That's the beginning point. So get ready because I have found my God when I give God just gives back. He just continues to give and give and give and give. And I'm not looking for finances back. He may choose to do that. But I believe God's going to bless this congregation. I believe that. See, you're part of this. You're, you're part of this giving. And you can, you can get into your, well, I, do, I could really use that $1,000. I have bills to pay. And I, I believe you do. And I'm not condoning that or putting that down. I understand that. But when we go from self and our little world, have you ever seen um, Jesse Walters on Fox News? This is, I'm Jesse and this is my world. Well, here's us and here's our world. And we want to bless them this coming year. How many, will you say at least amen? Will you agree to that and say amen? I believe that we need to be a giving church and give out of what God has done. Amen? Sandra's already up there. I was going to say, Sandra, will you go to the keyboard? Let's stand this morning. Are we influencing the people around us? That's the first question. The second question is, how, how are you influencing the people around you? Because you can, in this sphere, Jesse's world, Bob's world, Debbie's world, your sphere of influence, you can be negatively influencing people around you. They're saying, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want any part of it. And if we in the body of Christ today are splintered and split and, and we're separated and we've allowed opinions to come in and, and, and we've, we've taken a stand and we've become staunch and dogmatic and, and we're not going to change. I wouldn't want that. But when the world sees an evidence, a demonstration, And one of the biggest demonstrations of the power of God is is to see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ exuding from and coming forth from our hearts and our lives. And, And they can feel that love. They may not understand it. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand that full gospel meeting I first went into. But but there's something that was just coming out from the people. It was the love of God. It was a joy that was within them that I saw. How many know people are looking? They're looking for a demonstration of the love of the Father. They're looking. They're searching in so many different ways. Debbie's been reading a book. Who's the author? Tom Horn? Tom Horn. He was on um, Joni Lamb's show the other day. This gentleman gets into the book and about um, Epstein's Island. He gets into the book, very interesting facts of how the Washington Monument, the Vatican, the Capitol, have ties to Freemasons behind it. And you say, what's Freemasons? Start studying, I'm not, I could go off in that area. 
but there's hexagons, right? There's satanic symbols in Washington, D.C. It gets into it gets into what was going on in some of the president's offices during their terms where they actually had seances, seances in the White House. You say, Ashley, you're getting into the conspiracy theory. There is no, I just talked about that. This man has really studied and, and really, so his name's Tom Warren. What's the name of the book? Shadowlands is the name of the book. Folks, we don't have any idea what the enemy is trying to do. We have no idea sometimes. We, we are deceived in some manner of realizing how the enemy plots to overtake you and I, the church. But we need to rise up and we need to see the power of God come like never before. The power of God's going to defeat the devil. He already did it 2,000 years ago through the cross. And I believe he's going to be defeated once again for ever. That's right, Marianne. Forever. Forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. How many believe God is good this morning? And God's looking for a witness in the church today. Hallelujah of the Father's love, of the Father's compassion, of the Father's mercy, the Father's grace. That doesn't, and, and to come to that place, there has to be a spirit of repentance. That we repent of those things that would stop us. Father, I just pray this morning that there would be a demonstration of your love. Oh, God. Oh, God, we need you. People of God need you. We don't want to lose out in this hour ahead. We want to just be on the very edge, the cutting edge of what you're doing. Oh God, work within the body of Christ to bring healing that we might have a strong witness out there. Because when we leave these doors today, we're out in the world and the people that surround us are looking for an example of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you dealt with the religious leaders of the day. Father, forgive us for a religious spirit and allowing that within us. Father, may you deal with a religious spirit that would look down upon people, would condemn. But Father, may we be people that would want to see people come into your kingdom and we just love upon them. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do. Hallelujah. 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 Sandra, if we could just praise him and thank him for closing.
That you're here now. 